And uh, I'd like you to take your Bibles then and go back to that text that I had read for you earlier as we uh, look to God's Word this morning in our studies, Romans chapter 11. I'm not sure how to approach things sometimes, but I, I was thinking about this quote uh, this morning. Uh, during the Second World War, 1942, uh, Winston Churchill had delivered a, fee, uh, a famous speech, at least from it, a quote at the Mansion House in London. It was just after the British uh, army had overrun the German forces in Egypt and pushed them out of Egypt. It was after that victory that Churchill got up and said, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. And in many ways, we are in a situation where I suppose we could say that this global crisis, if you want to call it that, is not the end. It's not even perhaps the beginning of the end. There's more that we will face. There is yet to see all the things that will happen and transpire till perhaps we see victory over these things. But perhaps it is the end of the beginning, and I think it is. This is a, a significant step forward as God has answered our prayers and moved uh, in our government to allow these opportunities for places of worship to, to gather. Yes, in limited numbers, uh, but as those of you who are gathered here see, that that has not been too arduous. The team has put together an opportunity for us to meet here, and that will grow as time goes by, and we give praise and honor to God for that. But it's a reminder to us here that one of the things that we struggle with perhaps is, well, what's the plan? Perhaps you follow every day through the news and, and looking to the website of our government and the news. Well, they have a plan in place, and you have stage one and two and three, and it gets a bit convoluted depending on where you're living and what region and who can do what and so on. And sometimes you begin to wonder, is there really a plan out there at all? Does the plan make sense? Even as we have planned as a church here, put together our action plan and looking at, well, this seems to be what we should do, but we're not sure. Let's, let's try that and, and hopefully it will work and, and we'll be fine. We're, we're looking for a plan, but the plan doesn't always seem to be going in the direction that we want it to. And I see that here today in the text before us. What we have to find here is, as God works in his people the nation of Israel, the Gentiles of the world. As God begins to work in there, I want us to think today about the big peak picture. That though it seems to be very confusing, God has a plan. Let me put it this way, all right? If you forget anything else we might talk about here today, I just want to be in your minds this. God has a plan, always had a plan, will never change his plan, and will finally bring his plan to perfect completion. God has a plan. Always had a plan. Will never change his plan. And will finally bring his plan to perfect completion. Even though as he's putting together and fulfilling his plan. It doesn't look quite the way we think it should. Do you understand? Now I'm not using that phrasing in the context of often used kind of hallmark phrase, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That is not a text of Scripture, by the way, just if you thought you could find that somewhere. It's not there. Yes, God is a God of love, and He shows His love in a myriad of ways, and God has a plan, but it seems supremely naive to think that that plan can reduce to this one little thing, that, that God has a plan for me, and this is what He's going to do. He does have a plan, but the plan he has for you is not always what you think it is. God has a plan, always had a plan, will never change his plan, and will finally bring his plan to perfect completion. That's what we think about here today. And that means that what we are experiencing in the world is in every sense of the word part of God's plan. It isn't as if God is putting his plan for the universe and for his people and, and charts it one direction, then an oops, a, a virus pops up in some part of the world, and, and that begins to spread, and so God goes to plan B, and now we'll do it this way, and if that, we go to plan C. God has one plan, known only to himself, and the sovereign purpose is to bring to bear that plan in order that as he works in the hearts of people like you and me, he will bring all the glory to himself. And we'll see that, I trust, in our text here. Because Israel itself 
and the people of God in Romans chapter 11 are very much experiencing that part of God's plan that we maybe don't understand. We've been going through Romans in, in Romans chapter 9 through 11, this almost insertion by Paul because he's afraid some people may confuse what he's doing. Paul, for eight chapters, has been talking about the wonderful gospel, the justification by grace through faith to sinners like you and you and me. And the beauty of that has been embraced more emphatically, if you will, by the Gentiles and not the Jews to whom Jesus came first, Romans 1, 16 and 17. They have rejected that, and now the sweep of the gospel is bringing people in from every different tribe and nation, all the Gentiles coming in. And so, at the end of chapter 8, Paul, in his very systematic mind, realizes that there is a whole raft of people who might question the promises of God. If God had promised blessings to his people, the Israelite nation, and the gospel comes and is having great benefit to the Gentiles and not the Israelites, the Jews, there must be something wrong with God's plan. Or more, there's something wrong with God himself. He's not getting it right. We can't trust him because his promises for his plan don't seem to be coming to fruition. So then Paul in Romans 9, 10, 11 embarks on this opportunity saying, no, not at all. God has a plan and he's not changing it. It's just how we have perceived his plan needs correcting, needs alteration. And so that has been taking us through these chapters, 9, 10, and 11. In chapter 12, Lord willing, when we get back there, Paul then almost returns, really, to where he finished with chapter 8, and then begins to talk about the applications and the ways in which we put into practice this wonderful theme of justification by grace through faith. But here, as he brings this chapter to a conclusion, the whole point is that, that God will complete his plan, and what we need to do is trust in him and his plan. As the psalmist says in Psalm 33, 10 and 11, the Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples, but the plans of the Lord stand forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. There's that plan that never changes, right? That's what God is doing, and he's doing it here as well. So with that introduction, let's go back to the text that I read for you earlier, Romans chapter 11 and verse 11, and, and walk through these verses ever so briefly, given the time frame we have this morning. And I want you to see here what God is doing about this plan. Now, at the outset, we, I don't have the, uh, shall we say, the intelligence to answer all the questions you might have coming out of Romans chapter 11. Uh, but I do have some insights as to what I see God doing here and want to share those as we have that sort of overriding picture of God's plan and what he's doing here and then make some application for these things. But it comes into chapter 11, we looked at the first 10 verses there, is the whole rejection of the gospel among the Israelite nation themselves. But that doesn't mean that God's promise to bless Israel has failed. That was the concern. The present situation in which the Israelite believers are this remnant within Israel, and Gentile believers that is growing in number each day, has caused some confusion, but it's all part of God's plan for his people. He will, through his infinite wisdom, do a great work in his people whom he chose. In fact, if, if you again look at your, your scriptures, this is Paul's great concern. In chapter 9, for instance, verses 1 through 5, what is Paul's concern there? For his own people, the Jews. In fact, he says, I'd be willing to give up my salvation if some of them would be saved. His heart is very much for his people, those from whom he has come and been raised. Chapter 10, verse 1, the same thing. Brothers and desires, excuse me, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. So while Paul has become, as we'll notice in the text here, very much a, a, an apostle to the Gentiles, missionary to the Gentiles, he very much has a heart for his own people as well. And that sort of passion courses through his veins, as it were, and comes to fruition here in Romans chapter 11, particularly now verses 11 to the end here. And so let's look at Paul's love in that way. And here I'm going to suggest we're going to break this section into four parts, and we'll just touch on each one a little bit here this morning, and you can uh, kind of take some time to pull out other ideas as you go through this. First of all, uh, in verses 11 to 15, I would suggest that God's purpose in rejecting Israel, there's a purpose there, and this is what I would call the confusing part of the plan. 
Because usually if we think of a plan that's going to clarity and understanding is everything falls into place as we want it to. But it's confusing here because in the beginning of the section, we see something of the nature of this plan that doesn't make sense from a human standpoint. It's confusing because the stumbling of Israel has provided the occasion for carrying the message of the gospel of salvation to the Gentiles. But it doesn't make sense here because God made his promises to Israel. Look at verse 11. Again, I said, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Saying, again, if the plan was for the nation of Israel and all the promises for them, have they stumbled to the point where they'll never be recovered? This harkens back to chapter 11, verse 1, where he first asked the question, did God reject his people? Is this something God has done? He says, no, absolutely not. God always has a remnant, a few believers in his nation that will bring to bear the wonders of the gospel later on. And here, have they then fallen so far they're beyond recovery? Absolutely not. God will recover them. He will bring them back to bear. And so just notice, if you want, the, the way in which this whole section starts to play itself out. God shows us here through his word, as Paul directs for us here, is that their stumbling brought a blessing to the Gentiles. The gospel goes, the Jews reject it, the Gentiles are the ones who receive it. But then he tells us here, but the reason he has blessed the Gentiles, God has, is so that he might create envy within his own people so that they will desire the gospel itself. Isn't that what the text tells us? Verse 2, rather because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Now, you can jot down Acts 13, 42 to 49. You can study that a little later or other parts of there where uh, Paul, and I think Barnabas is there. Well, don't correct me on that. But Paul, at least, preaching there. Uh, and, and at that point, he goes to the, as he would do always, go to the local synagogue and, and speak there and kind of gets pitched out of that. And he preaches the next Sabbath day. And it says that many people are coming to know the Lord through him. And all the Jews become jealous. And so the sense in which we have here is that the blessing to the Gentiles was to stir up envy within the people of Israel. Why? So that they would desire the gospel. It's God's plan, you see, to bring them back in. They're rejected, and in their rejection, the Gentiles are gladly brought in to bear in these things. The blessings that come to them are so that somehow the Jews themselves become envious. It goes on and tells us that further. Verse 13, I'm talking to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. Notice, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. And so the confusing part of the plan that God has is in his rejection of Israel. It is not total. It is not eternal. There's a remnant. God has a plan. And his plan is through the Gentiles to arouse this desire in his own people for the Messiah himself. How that will play out, I think the rest of the chapter gives us some indication of that. But this is how uh, one commentator put it. He said, Paul is saying that the salvation of the Gentiles was intended in the divine providence to arouse in Israel a passionate desire for the same good gift. Now, keep this in mind. If I forget to say it later on. The gift and the blessing of salvation is exactly the same for Jew and Gentile alike. At some point, I might forget to say some important things, but I want that to be here because those who interpret Romans 11 and those in past days and some in our modern days would indicate to us here that really God has two separate plans. One that he's engaging in with the Jew, and one for everyone else. But that is not biblical. The scriptures remind us, irrespective of how the end will be, and whether God does a great work of conversion for the Jewish nation, or he's doing that now, or what these events will take place in the end, we'll think about that. Irrespective of that, doesn't matter. There's one plan of salvation. And it's through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Messiah. So nobody gets converted that doesn't do it that way. I love to look at the scriptures and saying, you know, God has revealed some things very clearly to us. Some things he hasn't. And let's be very sure of the things that he has made clear. Let's be open to the things he hasn't. 
There are some who go to the ones that aren't quite so clear and stake their lives on it. And I fear for them because like anyone and myself being a Christian these many years, um, the basics and truths of Christianity, the doctrines have always been there as I've learned them. But, you know, my mind has been changed a few times on some of these things. And I might waver back to one and the other. And that's okay if it's not one of those critical areas. But keep that in mind. The critical nature of God's plan is salvation by one means, Jesus Christ. And so the rejection of the Israelites was a means to bring blessing to the Gentiles, which in turn would create a jealousy in the Israelites so that they would want the blessings of the gospel and find Messiah Jesus in that way. Listen, just at the outset, let me make this point. The fact that we might find God's plan a bit confusing is simply means that He is God and we aren't. That's all it means. Don't, don't sit here or on your couch with your morning coffee and toast. I know you get it better than the rest of us. We'll have to have breakfast after service or something. No, we can't do that. Not allowed, sorry. But as we think of this here in terms of that, that's the fact. Because we can't understand doesn't necessarily mean that we just have to dig deeper. It means that God's reserved for himself some things that he knows clearly and hasn't done so for us. And what I want to see at the end of the message today, if the Lord allows us time, is that the God's plan at the foundation, at the, at the core, at the heart of his plan is his character. It's him. The, the plan he puts forth is a display of his glorious, holy character. And that sets him far above and beyond us. And so we look at that and say, I don't quite understand that. Good. God did not intend for us to have full understanding. He's God and we aren't. So stop burning all those brain cells trying to figure out stuff that God won't make clear. I'm not saying we shouldn't study it. Study the scriptures deeply. Look at these things. Discuss end time theology and, and what God would do with the Israelite nation. Absolutely. But don't blow a blood vessel because somebody beside you doesn't think that this is going to happen in the end, and you do. God's got it covered. Don't worry about it. So that's the first thing to remember. God's purpose in rejecting, that's a confusing part of the plan. He's God, we're not. Secondly, here in verses 16 to 24, we'll talk about the interrelationship of the Jews and the Gentiles. And this is the intricate illustration of the plan. That intricate illustration of the plan. Now, this is one of those sections, and again, if you've been walking through these uh, studies with us, you'll, you'll see it here. It's, it's fairly clear, this allegory or parable or metaphor, whatever term you want to use to describe what Paul says next, is his way of illustrating God's plan, specifically for the people of Israel, the Jews and Gentiles and so on, but ultimately for the glory of God. So, so look at where it goes here. It begins really kind of halfway between um, verse 16. So I've just said first 15 verses for part one, beginning in next verse 16 here to 24. But it talks about this olive tree. And branches, wild ones and natural ones cultivated in this, this olive tree. And one of the dangers we have when we discuss, whether it's parables or allegories, is uh, we try to make more of it than we should. There are people who look at these things, and in every specific word, you're going to try and find some meaning and, and extrapolate from this little thing here all sorts of ideas that have no basis in Scripture at all. We have to be very careful that we don't find ourselves doing that. And here, I think the basic structure of this is easy to understand. Look at verse, uh, fit, latter part of 16. If the root is holy, so are the branches. So it's talking about a root of this olive tree, and the branches that come out of it are holy. They're, they're special, set apart. He says, if some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive root, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to the other branches. Now stop there. So who are the branches that have been broken off? Well, as you go on through the text here, you know that was Israel, parts of Israel broken off. The unfaithful ones, there are the faithful ones who continue, the Abraham and so on by faith believe. There's the remnant, but the unbelieving ones, they're, they're broken off. So that's fairly easy to understand, I think, if I'm not preaching heresy. And if you look there again, then who are the ones, he says, and you though a wild, well, who's the wild olive shoot? Well, it must be then the Gentiles who are brought in. In fact, 
Paul was writing to Christians primarily in, in Rome, and so they would be mostly Gentiles at that point. So the idea is you, the wild olive shoot, are grafted in among the others, and you now receive the nourishing sap that comes up from the root. Now, as this illustration continues, it, you recognize if you're big into horticultural stuff. In fact, thank you again. Uh, just kudos out to um, uh, Georgina and Earl who were here planting some lovely flowers and, and so on to brighten things up for today, for those of us who did show up. Uh, it's there. And, and so if you've got this green thumb, you, you will know that, that basically here you, you don't start grafting in wild shoots into something you've cultivated. It's the, the natural ones, the cultivated ones you might do into a wild plant and try and make it grow and so on. Uh, but Paul is not unaware of these things. It's there. The, the, the picture he's trying to show us here is that it really does go against nature in what he's doing here. And, and so the point is, here we have this root, and who is the root here? It doesn't tell us. Some would speculate it's the patriarchs or maybe Abraham himself. But, but the nation of Israel rises out of this. The unbelieving ones, they're broken off branches. And grafted in are these wild roots, the Gentiles, so that together they'll nourish from the root and grow and to praise the Lord himself. But his concern here is for the Gentiles first, that somehow they'll think of them as superior than the others. Well, we've been grafted. Look at us. Look at where we are. He says, be very careful. Don't be conceited. You came by faith. You better be very careful that you continue by faith and trust the Lord in this, or you might yourselves be broken off. He's not saying here you'll lose your salvation, but be sure of who you are and you're in the tree. You're part of grafted in that you are part of the Lord. You see the picture there is be very careful. Because just as unbelieving Israelites were broken off, you who aren't truly saved, you think you're in, you might be, who knows? Make sure your faith is true. Don't be conceited. He says in verse 22, Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in this kindness. The, the way that God has graciously brought in. And so there should be at the very least in this illustration, the reminder to us who have been grafted in, if you will, of humility and gratitude and praise. And I think, as Paul here, a hunger not only for others to be saved, but certainly for the Jewish nation. If we want to see God's blessing here, there is the reality that they can be grafted back in. Verse 23, and if they do not persist in unbelief, they'll be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Verse 24, after all, if you were cut out by an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, this is where it sets the whole hearts aflutter as to what this means in the end. And that will come up in the next section. And we'll leave it for that point there. But you see the illustration, right? It's a picture broken off, Gentiles in. At some point, then believing Jews will be grafted back in. The work of the gospel that will go to them. And in the end, and I think this is some bearing on us here, all Israel will be saved, that all the people of God, Jew and Gentile, will make up one people, the glorious family of God, who will one day reside in his presence forever and ever. So that brings us to point three. Salvation of all Israel. The significant goal of the plan. Verses 25 to 32. Look at verse 25. It says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Now, when Paul and the scriptures talk about mystery, it is not in the way that so often we call mysteries. You might be a fan of mystery books, whodunit TV shows and so on. And the idea of the mystery there is there's clues and you, you use the clues and evidence and you, you discover and you uncover the mystery. That's not the way it's used here at all in the scriptures. The, the mystery that's used here and elsewhere in the scriptures in reality shows us that it's something that was previously hidden that has now been revealed. Something that was hidden that is now revealed. And so in the context of what God is doing, something God has kept hidden, he reveals at some point through whatever means. And so the mystery here, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, verse 25 of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you will not be conceited. We talked about that. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until a full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, verse 26, all Israel will be saved. Now, there's much debate on how the wording should be done here. 
depending on your translation, the, the New International Version has, has kind of given us their rendering here, experiencing a hardening in part until a full number of the Gentiles come in, or some would say the full measure, or the, I think some translations say the fullness. And the evidence from some would say here that basically Israel is hardened, as God has turned them aside, and they've turned themselves aside, until the gospel plan has finished for the Gentiles, and then through that means Israel will be saved. Does that mean that's the end, that through all this time as the gospel goes to Jews, we're converted at the same time, and the end comes, God's done and he comes? Or is there a component here when it says all Israel will be saved? Is the nation of Israel in some form that after all the Gentiles come in that God is satisfied with, as it were, then now this great outpouring of the gospel comes and the nation of Israel is saved, swept into the kingdom itself? At least one of you is smirking over there, so I'll have to talk to him later. <laughs> just, Ken and I talked about this before, and we have all of our points, and he and I, I think, are on the same page. We'll talk about it some more. But no, it's a wonderful, because here's where, again, a lot of the discussions happen here. Just keep in mind, it doesn't matter. God has a plan, right? Keep that in mind. Because either way you look at it here, the focus is not ultimately Israel or the Gentiles or the church. It's ultimately God and his plan and his glory that he's doing, you see. He's unpacking these things for us. Now, depending on where you come from, if you're an old-style dispensationalist, you'll have your views. If you're a more moderate premillennial, you'll have your views that are some here, some there. If you're from the Reformed camp and you're more amill, which is kind of how I was raised, and you'll have your views here. But, you know, I've looked at these and modified them here, and at the very least... It seems to me that the text will show us that at some point before the Lord comes again, there'll be an outpouring of the gospel in such a way that many of the Jewish nation will be converted. Not likely all of them. I don't think every single one of them at that time will be. Some do. But there will be a sense in which the gospel will go forward and many will come to saving faith. Because that's so much part of the goal here. If you look at Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul's concern is for the nation of Israel. And they have a place here. But yet you have the intrusion, if you will, of the Gentiles, the churches here as well. See, if you're going to have these discussions, uh, no, I won't get into it. We'll leave it for another day. I was just going to say, but I will say this. Part of the difficulty, and this I struggle with as a pastor and a theologian, is it's so often our theological systems that dictate how we read Scripture. Do you know what I mean by that? So if you're a dispensationalist, like it or not, you read scriptures a certain way, in many ways because of your belief system. If you're a covenant theologian and you see it from an amillennial perspective, you read the scriptures from your theological position. Now you will say, no, 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 pastor, I see it always in the scriptures. Okay, <laughs> if you say that, there's no point in us arguing anymore. But th the point is, we are all products of our own system of thinking. We have our favorite Bible teachers, our favorite theologians, whatever, and they all might be good. All I'm saying is, big caution, big yellow uh, flag out there, big red flag is, be very careful that your theological system doesn't dictate your understanding of the Scriptures, but your understanding of the Scriptures dictates your theological system. It's always got to be that way. In fact, here's a thought. Let's just stop talking about theological systems and talk about the Scriptures. What do they say? Let those determine what we do here. And so here, I think the point would be is that God does have a plan for his nation, his beloved nation. But it is through the gospel that they will find their blessing. It is as they return to Messiah, provoked in envy because of the Gentiles who have the blessing, that God will bring them back in whatever fashion. Now, the future, it's up to God. But it is the gospel itself, Jesus Christ, that will grow and they will become envious and they'll come pouring out to it. Yes, I've missed it. That's it. And the Gentiles will rejoice as well. And ultimately, the people of God, no longer Jew or Gentile, but one in Christ, will sing the praises of our risen and reigning king. Now again, there's more that comes out of this and I recognize our time uh, doesn't allow us too much to go further here. Let me go to my fourth point. And that is what I would suggest is more of your benediction. And that is praise to God, which is the ultimate aim of his plan. 
Paul draws his argument to a conclusion here that while God always has a people, a remnant, saved by grace, and through grace he will bring to conclusion all of his plan, the goal ultimately and the aim of his plan is that praise will be to him. Now notice again in the text that Paul has been for these three chapters uh, sharing with us the wonders of God's gracious plan for his people. And what does he do at the end of it? He doesn't say, now folks, let's go to the next point in chapter 12. He just explodes into what we call this doxology, this praise of God. Let me just walk through these verses with you quickly. He begins to, as this, he says, plumb the depths of, of the character of God. Oh, the depth of the riches, of the wisdom, and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Verse 33 sets the standard for you, if you will, and a reminder, as we've looked at here, is that God's plan always finds its foundation and its heart in the character of God. It's because of him and not us. And, and you can read in, in middle chapters of Job, latter chapters of Job, and Isaiah as well, so you find these descriptions of, you know, how do you compare to God? And in fact, we could say, with whom or with what do you compare God? Because he's incomparable. There's nothing with which you can compare God because God is solitarily, singularly alone in who he is. There's nothing to compare him to. But we have human language, and so we try, and we do our best. And we have this, what we call anthropomorphic language, where we talk about God with mighty hands and so on. He doesn't really have hands. He's a spirit. But we attempt these things. And he says, the depth of his riches of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments. How do you begin to search the judgments of an unsearchable God? How do you trace his paths, which are beyond tracing out? Well, you can't. Well, you can get little touches of it and glimpses of it, and God reveals these things for us. And he, he gives us tastes of heaven, if you will, that, that draw us in deeper to pursuing him and delighting in him. But, but you can't ultimately know these things, can you? Why? Because it's God. As we said earlier, we aren't. And yet he wants us in his plan to see, here's the aim, the glory of God. Verse 34, who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Now that's beautifully portrayed for us here. And I think in, in the context of what is given to us here, uh, Isaiah 40, 13 is where Paul is gaining that quotation from or that perspective, if you will. Who has been the counselor of the Lord? Think about that for a moment. All right, I, I do counseling for premarital and during marriage and other means and um, I'm you know do the best you can but sometimes I need someone to counsel me and so, well, who's going to counsel God just, just see the, the, the sheer insanity of the thought but you know we try to we attempt to tell God what he should be doing God you're not doing that quite right Lord let me tell you how to do that you know just bite your tongue even thinking about that now you can't who counsels the great counselor himself Verse 35, who has ever given to God that God should repay them? How much could we give God that we should expect him to repay us? I just shudder at even thinking about it. But again, what Paul is doing is trying to, shall we say, expand the horizons of our understanding of the character of God. There is nothing we can do to get him to repay us. He's God. And, and rather than bring God down to us, which we want to do as humanity, we, we send him further this direction. No, he, God is beyond me. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. You see, the, the whole aim of the plan, guess what? Is not to satisfy the curiosities of end-time prognosticators. It is not even so it will ultimately encourage our hearts before the Lord, though that is a good goal to have. It is ultimately to set God apart as to who he is and draw us into humble praise and adoration of him. Because I can guarantee you that in God's sovereign plan, when he ushers in the new heavens and new earth, included in his plan will not be courses on end-time theology. It's not going to be there. There will be no discussions on how it's all going to finish because it's finished. And all day, every day, we will serve and praise him for eternity. If that's the end game, if that is the plan of Almighty God, 
then every fiber of our being should be taken up with pursuing that plan. God, we don't see quite how it's going to work, but you've got it. We'll pursue you and we'll trust you and follow you. And at the end of the day, understanding God, or at least uh, having confidence in God and trusting in his plan will give us the desire and joy in pursuing him. You know, it was this morning, I forget, two, three in the morning, usually Sunday mornings, it's about the time I wake up and start worrying about, did I remember what to say today for the sermon? And, and the Lord brought to mind the 23rd Psalm. It just, it didn't say it to me, but it just came to mind. And, and especially in talking about the plan of God was, of course, the last verse, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's the plan. In the house of the Lord forever, we will dwell and sing his praises. And dear friends, that's what Paul does for us here in this chapter. And if that's our goal, then we rejoicingly, lovingly trust the plan to him to accomplish and we to serve him. Heavenly Father, please do that in us that you would so change and work in our hearts that we would understand more and more of the plan you have for us in pursuing you, our God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.